Now, I encourage you to take your Bible and open, please, to the Gospel of Mark, chapter 13. We're going to look at verses 32 down to verse 37 of Mark, chapter 13. And would you stand for the reading of God's Word, please? This will be the last time I make you stand. Unless, of course, you don't want to go home. You can sit here the rest. Mark, chapter 13, verse 32. But of that day and that hour knoweth no man... No, not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son, but the Father. Take ye heed, watch, and pray, for ye know not when the time is. For the Son of Man is as a man taking a far journey, who left his house and gave authority to his servants, and to every man his work, and commanded the porter to watch. Watch ye therefore, for ye know not when the master of the house cometh, at even or at midnight, or at the cock crowing, or in the morning, lest coming suddenly he find you sleeping. And what I say unto you, I say unto all, watch. Thank you. You may be seated. Pray with me today. Father, thank you for the word of God. And I pray, Lord, that you'll help me to make it so very clear And help us to apply truth to life, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Someone said there are four stages of life that can be measured to your relationship to Santa Claus. You believe in Santa Claus, and then you don't believe in Santa Claus, and then you are Santa Claus, and then finally you look like Santa Claus. For those who are yet in the early stages of this relationship... They're, they're, they like to sing a song that is popular around this time of year, Santa Claus is Coming to Town. And there's a line in that song that we all know very well, you better watch out, you better not cry. We're not going to sing the song right now, but, but the line, you better watch out, why should you watch out? Well, because Santa Claus is coming. Now, our text today has absolutely nothing to do with Santa Claus, but it has everything to do with someone who is coming. And that someone is the Lord Jesus Christ. And really, the line of that song, you better watch out, is really the message of the verses that we just read. Three times in this passage, we're told to watch. Verse 33, where it says, take ye heed, watch and pray. And then in verse 35, notice where it says, watch ye therefore. And then finally in verse 37, at the end, he says, watch. Now, why does Jesus give such emphasis on this? Well, I want us to take a close look at this, and we'll understand why. But let me, let me remind you about the context of this whole passage here, and actually all of Mark chapter 13. We're dealing with the famous sermon that Jesus preached that is known as the Mount Olivet Discourse, because he gave this on the eastern slope of Mount Olive, on the Mount of Olives with his disciples. And this is our Lord's description of his second coming. Scripture tells us very clearly that Jesus is coming again. He's coming back. And when he does, he will judge the unbeliever, the ungodly, and those who have not received the gospel. 2 Thessalonians 1, 7 says, And to you who are troubled, rest with us, when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God, and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Revelation 19 says when he comes back, he will slay the ungodly with the sword of his mouth, of course, which is the word of God. And he will also establish his earthly kingdom. He will fulfill all the promises that he made in the Old Testament and in the New Testament regarding his reign, his millennial reign on earth. Now, remember when Jesus gave this sermon, this was during the Last week of his life, the Passion Week, you remember on Sunday he entered into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, he proclaimed himself the Messiah. On Monday he returned to the temple, and on the way in he cursed the barren fig tree, and it died immediately. Then he cleansed the temple. He threw out all the money changers and took complete control of the temple. On Tuesday he came back into the temple and really just took control, and he was there in the court of the Gentiles just teaching, and the Bible says they were hanging on every word that he said. 
But during the course of his teaching, on three different occasions, the religious leaders came and they challenged him. And Jesus, on each occasion, made them look foolish because they were unable to contend with the wisdom of Christ. And then on that Tuesday afternoon, end of the evening, Jesus left the temple with his disciples. And you remember when they were leaving, it says in chapter 13, verse 1, one of the disciples was just in awe at the temple. And he said, Lord, just look at these stones. Look at these massive stones. And Jesus then said, there's not one of those stones that will be left upon another. And on the way to the Mount of Olives, as they went out the eastern gate, down through the Valley of Kidron, ascended the eastern slope of the Mount of Olives, Jesus was teaching his disciples about his second coming. They wanted to know. In fact, they asked him, they said, Lord, tell us when shall these things be? What shall be the sign of your coming? They wanted to know about the end of the age. They had really a shallow understanding of eschatology. They wanted to know all the signs. They wanted to know what to expect. They heard Jesus say that he was going to be betrayed, that he was going to die on the cross after three days and then rise again. They were concerned about his death. They were concerned about the future kingdom. They were concerned about their own future. So they wanted to know all these things. And so in this sermon, the Lord really wants to do two things. He wants to comfort his disciples. He wants them to understand what's going to happen in future days. But he also wants to warn those who uh, don't know him. He will die, he will rise, but he will return again to establish his kingdom. So the intent of the Mount of Olives Discourse is to warn the world of his return and to comfort believers about his coming kingdom. So in this Mount Olivet Discourse, Jesus basically describes what history is going to be like just before he returns. And if you've been with us, you know we've gone through this Verses 5 to 13, he talks about the beginning of sorrows, the word sorrows, Odin, birth pains. These are the birth pains that will take place just before the arrival of the Lord Jesus. False Christs, wars and rumors of wars, earthquakes and famine and trouble. There will be persecutions towards the church. The gospel will be preached in all the world. People will be betrayed by their own loved ones, family Then there will be the abomination of desolation. That's a big sign. What's that? Something that will happen in the temple in Jerusalem that's so abominable, it'll be left desolate. And what will that be? Well, there's coming a world leader that the Bible calls the man of sin, the son of perdition. This is the Antichrist. He will promise a golden age of peace. He will present himself as the answer to all the problems of the world. In gratitude, the world will honor him and elevate him as the supreme leader. He will make peace with Israel, and then he'll break that peace, and he'll go into the temple in Jerusalem, and he will declare himself God. Now, according to Daniel's prophecy, this will happen during Daniel's 70th week, that seven-year period. Right in the middle of that seven-year period, the Antichrist will go into the temple. He will declare himself God. And then Jesus said, when that happens, what you'll see is great tribulation, such as not was since the beginning of the world to this time. And then there will also be cosmic disturbances. If you remember, remember, look at verse 24. But in those days after that tribulation, the sun shall be darkened, the moon shall not give her light. Just prior to the second coming of Christ, there will be a, a, a blackout universally, and the stars will veer off course, and the planets will fall from their orbit. And in the blackness and darkness of that time, the Bible says Jesus will come in the clouds of glory. Now, Jesus is finishing up this sermon, and when he finishes up, he gives two parables. We saw last time the parable of the budding fig tree in verse 28. He said, learn this, when our branch is yet tender and putteth forth leaves, you know that summer is near. Jesus would point to the fig tree that would shed its leaves in the fall and get new leaves in the spring. He said, look, When the springtime is there, the the branches get tender. The sap comes in, it makes it nice and tender, and then you start to see the budding of new leaves. When you see that happen, you know that summer is right around the corner. That's the season. Look in verse 29, he said, So ye in like manner, when ye shall see these things come to pass, know that it is nigh, even at the door. And Jesus says, In like manner, you can know the season when I'm going to come, And you can know the signs. When you see these things, and these things that he's talking about there 
in verse 29 are the signs that I already just went over with you. Jesus said, when you know the season and when you see the signs, you know that the coming is very close. He's right at the door, he said. How, how sure is it? Well, in verse 30, he said, this generation will not pass till all these things happen. In other words, that generation that sees these things, that generation that's in that season, when all those things begin to happen, that generation will not pass away until everything happens. It all comes to pass. How sure is it? Verse 31, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. It's just as sure as the word of God itself that Jesus is coming. Now, with all that in mind, Jesus is giving the conclusion to this sermon, the passage that we just read. In these last few verses, the main message of this is watch out, you better watch. And I want you to see three ways in which Jesus emphasizes to be watchful. You can write down, number one, a surprising admonition. Look what Jesus says in verse 32. But that day and of that hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son, but the Father. Now, this is a surprising statement. This had to surprise the disciples. In fact, it surprises us, right, to hear Jesus say these words. How could Jesus not know the day or the hour? When he says the day or the hour, he's simply saying the precise moment. I don't know the precise moment. Jesus said you can know the season, and you can see the signs. You can know it's coming close. It's right at the door. But I don't know the precise moment. No one knows that, not even me, only the Father. You say, how can that work together? Well, if I said to you, in the next 40 years, the Ravens are going to win the Super Bowl sometime in the next 40 years. Now, why are you laughing? You don't believe me. That's, that's skepticism. Shame on you. If I said in the next 40 years, they're going to win. Now, I don't know the precise day. I don't know the precise hour when that's going to happen. And so we can understand what Jesus is saying here when he says this. But again, we're surprised to hear Jesus say, I don't know the precise time, but the Father does. And the question that comes to our mind when we read this is, if Jesus were God, then how could he not know? I mean, if he's God, God is omniscient, right? He knows everything. So how can he not know the precise time when he's going to come. And this was a dilemma for many theologians. In fact, this perplexed even the brilliant 13th century theologian Thomas Aquinas, who because of this formulated what he called the accommodation theory. What was his accommodation theory? Well, Aquinas said that Jesus had to know the day and the hour because he's God incarnate. So Jesus must have known and chosen not to tell the disciples because the answer to their question was so mysterious, it was so theologically difficult, they could not grasp it, so he would accommodate by saying, I don't know the day or the hour. However, with all due respect to Mr. Aquinas, if Jesus told the disciples he didn't know the day when he really knew the day and the hour, that would be lying. And if he uttered even one lie, that would disqualify him from being our Savior. So we have to take seriously what Jesus said about not knowing. And in order for us to really understand this, let me just give you a little bit of a theology lesson here about the doctrine of Christ. Did you know throughout the history of the church, the doctrine of Christ has been attacked with regard to the nature of Christ? In the fifth century, there was a two-pronged attack on Christ. There were, first, there was a group called the Monophysite, a heresy from the Monophysites, this is from two words, mono meaning one, physicist meaning nature. And the Monophysites taught that Jesus didn't have two natures, a divine nature and a human nature. He only had one nature, and it was a mixture of the human and the divine. This was taught by a man by the name of Eutychus. And Eutychus said that Christ's nature was neither truly divine nor truly human. Rather, it was a mixture of the divine and the human. And then on the other side... The other extreme was Nestorianism. Nestorius argued that since Christ has two distinct natures, one divine and the other human, that he therefore must have two distinct personalities. If there are two natures, 
then there must be two persons. So what we have here is the doctrine of Christ attacked from both sides. One denying the dual nature of Christ by reducing it to a single nature that's a mixture of the human and the divine, and the other affirming two natures but that are not united together in one. And these two heresies force the church to come together and to clarify this doctrine. And this happened at the Council of Chalcedon where they said, and they gave the biblical definition of understanding the nature of Christ, that Christ is one person with two natures. They said, vera homo and vera deus. That is to say, homo meaning the same, or vera meaning um, truly, uh, truly man, or homo also, also meaning man, truly man and truly God. That's the idea here, that Christ is truly man, and he's truly God. Christ has a human nature, and he has a divine nature. And those two natures are united perfectly together in one person. And those natures are not separated in one person. They're united together perfectly in one person, and yet they're distinct. The two natures are not blended so as to render a deified human or a humanized deity. The human nature is always human, subject to human limitations. The divine nature is always divine. For instance, when Jesus came down to Bethlehem, when God became flesh, at the incarnation, the divine mind, which knew everything, he did not lose that omniscience. The human mind, of course, did not know everything. And so you have the divine mind and you have the human mind. Both are true. Both are there. Both are united together perfectly, but there's a distinction between the two. Now, we see this in the life of Jesus in the Gospels. There are times when Jesus did something that was a clear expression of his human nature, not the divine, but the human. For example, Jesus perspired. God doesn't sweat, but Jesus in his humanity did. Jesus got hungry. The Bible says in Psalm 50, God doesn't get hungry. God said, if I were hungry, I wouldn't tell you. In other words, God doesn't get hungry. But Jesus got hungry. Jesus got tired and Jesus slept. The Bible says in Psalm 121, the God who keeps Israel neither slumbers nor sleeps. So what are we seeing here? These are expressions of his human nature, not his divine nature. On the cross when Jesus died, beloved, it was not the divine nature that died. God cannot die. If the divine nature died on the cross, the universe would just cease to exist. It wasn't the divine nature that died. It was the humanity that died. And so what I'm saying is it's important that we distinguish between the divine nature and the human nature so that we do not confuse them or blend them in such a way as to obscure the reality of either. As I said Both natures perfectly united in one person. There's no separation, but there is a distinction. And the divine mind at times would communicate things to the human mind of Jesus. We see this in his earthly ministry. He knew things that no man could know. And when that happened, it was a divine mind that communicated things to the human mind. And we would see glimpses of the omniscience of God in the person of Christ. There were times, however, when... His omniscience was veiled. For example, did you know the Bible says in Luke 2 that when Jesus was growing up in Nazareth, the Bible says, listen to this, it says he he grew in wisdom and in stature. If you're God, how do you grow in wisdom? Again, that's an expression of his human nature. Jesus was subject to normal human growth, both physically and physically. And intellectually, what this tells us is that the divine nature did not swallow up his humanity. There were two distinct natures united perfectly in that one person. The human mind had access to the divine mind. So there were certain things, again, that Jesus knew by omniscience. But then there were times when the divine mind did not communicate things to that human mind. Jesus voluntarily restricted his divine nature in this area. Why did he do that? Because it was the will of the Father. 
And God, it was the will of the Father that Jesus not know certain things during his earthly ministry, and this was one of them, that he did not know the day or the hour when he would come, the precise moment. That was withheld from Jesus during this time. And so we take this at face value. Now, let me just say this. If Jesus didn't know the exact day or moment, why would other people think that they would? That's the problem I have with this. There are date setters out there, and they want to set a date about the coming of Jesus Christ. These folks are either delusional or they're intentionally deceptive. And I looked this up. Since Christ made this declaration, I wanted to find out how many date setters there actually have been in church history. I looked it up. You know what? I don't have the time to tell you of all these guys. I mean, it is hundreds, hundreds that are out there setting dates. Let me give you a brief summary. It started in 90 AD with Clement I. And then in the second century, there was a group called the Montanists who made a prediction about the coming of the Lord. And then there was Joseph Smith of Mormon fame, who predicted the Lord would come in 1832, then in 1890, when that didn't happen, then in 1891. Then there were the Millerites who said the Lord is coming March 21st, 1843. And when that didn't happen, they said, well, he's coming on October 22nd, 1844. That didn't work out either. Then there's Ellen G. White from the Seventh-day Adventists who said the Lord would come in 1850. When he didn't come, she said, well, it'll be 1856. Then there are the Jehovah Witnesses who said the Lord would come in 1914, 1915, 1918, 1920, 1925, 41, 75. Then in 1990... And you know what? They're still making dates. They're still doing it. Edgar Wisnett published a book, 88 Reasons Why the Rapture Will Be in 1988. That book sold millions. When that didn't happen, he wrote a follow-up book, 89 Reasons Why the Rapture Will Be in 1989. What's, What's really laughable about that is that people actually bought that second book. Then there was Harold Camping, who predicted the end of the world in 1994. And then again, he predicted on May the 21st, 2011, the Lord would come exactly at 6 o'clock p.m. sunset at Jerusalem. Then there was Ronald Wineland. Wineland predicted Jesus would return on the 29th of September, 2011. When his prediction failed to come true, he moved the date to Jesus' return to the 27th of May, 2012. When that prediction failed, he moved the date to the 18th of May, 2013, claiming that a day with God is as a year, giving himself another year for that prophecy to take place. By the way, Wineley was convicted of tax evasion in 2012. I mean, he obviously believed he wasn't coming back. He wasn't paying his taxes. He went to prison, and in prison he said Jesus would return on Pentecost in 2019, perhaps hoping to spring him from prison. In 2008, a guy named Mark Blitz began teaching that Christ's return would correspond with the, 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 the September 28, 2015 lunar eclipse. This was known as the blood moon prophecy. And, of course, it didn't happen. And on we could go, on and on. There are people that are still making dates, According to some, he should have come here in 2020. That didn't happen. I would have been all right with that. Listen, Jesus said of that day and that hour, knoweth no man. No man. And there are many practical reasons I can think of as to why God withheld the date. Can you imagine what things would be like if God gave us the actual date? Listen, our task is to be faithful to be busy, not to speculate about the hidden things of prophecy. God in his sovereign wisdom withheld that. And he simply told us, look, just watch, just watch. I'll give you the season, I'll give you the signs, but that's it, you need to watch out. Be watchful. The word watch, ah, hoop knows, literally without sleep. Be alert. God has fixed the day according to Acts chapter 1. Just as surely as God fixed the day when Jesus came the first time, when he would be born in Bethlehem, God has fixed the day when Christ is coming again. It's totally fixed. He knows it. It's not our business to try to figure out 
when that is. It's our business to look at the season, look at the signs, and be ready. The Bible says the secret things belong to the Lord our God, and the things which are revealed belong unto us. Let me give you the second thing quickly. Not only a surprising admonition, but a simple analogy. Jesus then follows up with just this parable, the parable of the absent homeowner. Look in verse 34. For the Son of Man is as a man taking a far journey who left his house and gave authority to his servants and to every man his work and commanded the porter to watch. Here's a homeowner, owner of a big estate. Obviously, he's a rich man. So rich he has many servants. He has a fence around his estate. And he's going on a long journey. And he leaves his servants in charge. They each have their own responsibilities. They've been given to them by the master. We see that, look in verse 34 again, where it says, every man his work. Each man, each servant has been given his job description, so to speak. He's been given his duty. He knows his work So what do we have here? We have something that's revealed to them. What is revealed to them? What's revealed is your responsibilities, your work. But there's also something in this parable that's not revealed. What is not revealed? When the master would come back. That's not revealed here. He says, I'm coming back. You have your responsibilities. You don't know when I'm coming, but I'm coming. And he says to the porter, that's the doorkeeper, This is the guy in front of the gate around which fenced the whole estate, the gate that opens and lets the master in. He says, look, you be awake, you be alert, you watch for the master, Kairos, the Lord of the house is coming. Now, this is a very simple parable. The servants of the house represent the people waiting for the second coming. The owner of the house is the Lord Jesus who is owns the house. He's coming. We don't know the day. We don't know the hour. The work of the servants, what's that? That represents the work we're supposed to engage in. God doesn't want us sitting around doing nothing, waiting. He doesn't want us setting dates, selling all we have, climb up to a mountain so we can be the first in line when he comes. He doesn't want us on mountaintops dressed in bed sheets singing hymns. He wants us busy doing his work. In the parable account in Luke 19, he said unto his servants, occupy till I come. Be busy doing your responsibilities till I come. You see, there's a difference in how you wait and how you watch. Here's a man, he comes home from work. The house is a mess. The kids are unruly. The wife is still wearing the robe from the morning. The egg is still on on her robe when she made breakfast. Her hair is done up in coat hangers. He says to her, what have you been doing? She says, I've been waiting for you. Here's another man that comes home. He comes in his house. It's immaculate. It's clean. There's dinner on the table. His wife is dressed up nice. He says to her, what have you been doing? She says, I've been waiting for you. There's a difference and how you wait. The Lord wants us to occupy. He wants us to be busy. He wants us to be doing what we're supposed to be doing, our responsibilities. So we see then a simple analogy. Let me give you the third thing, a solemn application. Look in verse 35. Watch ye therefore, for you know not when the master of the house cometh, at even or at midnight or at the cock crowing or in the morning. Again, the application is just very simple, very emphatic. Watch, be alert. When I went to college, it was a very strict college. We all had our dorm rooms, and they would have what was called a white glove inspection. We had to keep our rooms clean. They demanded it. The beds had to be made correctly. Everything had to be dusted. You had to have your closet in order the bathroom clean, and they would do these inspections. Now, the the key is we didn't know when they were going to come and do the white glove inspection. We didn't know. I mean, the dorm supervisor didn't give us a calendar with all the dates and said, I'm going to inspect on this day and on this day and on this day. If he had done that, you know what? Our room would have been a mess on those days he wasn't coming. Why worry about it? He's not coming that day. The key was we didn't know when he was coming. 
So we always had to keep it nice and ready for the white glove inspection. If you failed inspection, you got demerits. If you got demerits, you got in trouble. There was a way that they punished you. No one wanted that. So he never told us when he was coming. We had to keep our rooms ready every day. And I want to tell you something, friend. One day when Jesus comes back, he's going to have a white glove inspection of your life, of my life. He's going to want to examine everything. And this is the incentive that we have to live a pure life. John says this in 1 John 3, 3, And every man that has this hope, what hope? The hope of his coming, purifies himself even as he is pure. When Jesus comes, I don't want him finding me someplace I shouldn't be. I don't want him finding me doing something that I shouldn't do. Or I want him to find me serving diligently with the thing that he assigned for me to do. And as God's people, we have an assignment. God has given the church an assignment. We are to be worshiping. We are to be witnessing. We are to be working, warring spiritually and watching for him to come. And look again at verse 35. It says it could be at even or at midnight or at the cock crowing or in the morning. These were uh, the Roman times used to divide up the night. The Romans had four watches of the night. Remember, Mark is writing primarily to the Roman Gentile Christians, so he uses this Roman way of measuring time. The Romans had four three-hour periods of time from 6 to 9, that was considered even. From 9 to 12, that was midnight. From 12 to 3, that was the rooster crowing time. And believe me, I can relate to that. When I was in Africa, Uganda one time, they gave me a room, and right outside the window was a rooster. At 3 a.m. every morning, he went off like clockwork. That was the rooster crowing. From 3 to 6 was the dawn and the, again, the emphasis is you just don't know. It could be any of these times. Look at verse 36. Lest coming suddenly he find you sleeping. And specifically here he's talking to the doorkeeper. Listen, when the master comes back, he doesn't want the doorkeeper to be asleep. He wants him to be wakeful, watching, ready. You ever take a long journey, get home, and realize you forgot the keys and you're locked out of your door? Not fun. The doorkeepers to be ready. So when the Lord comes, he wants to find you ready, open arms, ready to receive him. The doors of your heart open, your life open, ready for the Lord's white glove inspection because you've been faithful, you've been true. Now you might say, well, now wait a minute. Preacher, Jesus is talking to his disciples at that time, or he's talking to a specific group of people. Does this really apply to me? I'm glad you asked. Look at verse 37. And what I say unto you, I say unto what? All. Everyone. This applies to all. Watch. Watch. You better watch. You better watch. Be ready. During his 1960 presidential campaign, John Kennedy would close his speech with a story about the, the Speaker of the Connecticut House of Representatives. On May 19, 1790, the sky at Hartford, Connecticut grew ominously dark. They had never seen a sky like that. Some of the delegates in there were worried that the judgment day was coming. And they asked for an adjournment, but the Speaker of the House, Davenport, said, the day of judgment is either approaching or it's not. If it's not, there's no cause for adjournment. If it is, I chose to be found doing my duty. So I wish that candles be brought, and let's work. Rather than fearing what is to come, we're to be faithful till Christ returns. We're not to fear the dark. We are to be lights in this world as we're waiting and watching for the return of Christ. Let's bow for prayer together.
Lord, we thank you for this beautiful passage of Scripture. How clear it is for us. The message is so very simple, so very straightforward. We are to be ready. We're not to try to figure out the exact precise time. We're just to be ready all the time. We're to watch. Be busy doing what you've given us to do, fulfilling our God-given responsibilities, our God-given role, being faithful until you return. And Lord, I pray that when you do come, that you'll not find us asleep spiritually or unready, but that we'll be diligent with the doors of our heart open, ready. Speak to hearts today, Lord. And I pray especially for those who are here today that don't know the Lord Jesus Christ. May they come to him today with heads bowed and eyes closed. This one principle of readiness, this applies here, but it applies in so many ways. For example, are you ready if death should come before the second coming? You can't guarantee me that you're not going to die today or tomorrow. If that were to happen, would you be ready? Is Jesus your Savior and your Lord? Salvation is so very simple. It's a gift provided by Jesus Christ, paid for by the precious blood of Christ, shed for your sins on the cross. You receive it by faith when you put your trust in him and him alone. And if you'll reach out in faith and say, Lord Jesus, save me, he'll save you. And if you're not saved, friend, I encourage you to get that settled right now. The only way you can be ready for death or his coming is to know that you're trusting in Jesus alone. Would you pray that? Would you say, Lord Jesus, save me. Save my soul. I'm trusting in you alone right now as my only source of salvation. Save me. Pray that. And friend, if you have, let us know. We want to rejoice with you. We want to encourage you in your Christian walk. Father, bless again this word to every hearing heart today. And we pray in Jesus' precious name.